it's good to see you. I've had a birthday since I've seen you. Uh, I asked somebody this morning about how old they thought I was, this young person. They said 82. <laughs> so that was, thank you very much. Um, but I counted a privilege. I, I, I am uh, three twenties. If anybody asks you how old I am, just say three twenties because I'm looking at it and thinking of it that way. It's a little easier to, to say that. Just three twenties is all it is. But I'm privileged to be here. I think about these young people that you guys would show up when you knew that I was preaching. Or some of you may say, no, we didn't know you were preaching. We might not have been here, but it's a privilege to be here with all of you. And uh, I don't take that for granted to be able to open up this great book and to be able to speak these wonderful words that God has given us. We're back in Psalms tonight in Psalm 18. Tommy preached this morning out of this passage. Now, if you've looked at it, don't get worried. It's 50 verses. And uh, you're already thinking about now, if he takes two minutes on each verse, it's going to be a long night. But usually we walk through a passage. We're going to trot through the passage tonight. Is that all right? Go through a little bit quicker, and I won't comment on some of the things. There's much in here, so many beautiful things. But we'll look at some uh, truths that I believe are so good. You know, uh, I do believe, Mark prayed just a moment ago. He prayed for me. And I never walk up here to share God's word without asking God to empty me. Because I know he's the preacher. He is the teacher to fill me up with him because he's the only one that is. And uh, I believe that as we study God's word together, whatever setting we're at, when we open this Bible, that we ought to expectantly look for our life to be different after having read it. That God would do something in our lives. I've sat in services since I was six years old. And I can take you back to times when I knew God spoke out of his word straight to me. And I've never been the same. So that's my prayer for me and for, for you tonight. This is another psalm where we're going to see God's going to tell us, uh, David's going to tell us who God is. David's going to tell us what's going on in his life. And David had some struggles, didn't he? He had some tough times. But tonight is a little bit different because in the middle of this psalm, we've seen this before where God uh, shows up and he does mighty things in David's life and in Israel's life. But tonight, God is going to show up in a big, big way. Now, there's a term that in military talk that is called Shock and awe. Remember hearing that before? Maybe during the time of the coalition forces in Desert Storm, they used that term, shock and awe. Let me tell you what it means technically. It's known as rapid dominance. It's a tactic based on the use of overwhelming power and spectacular displays of force to paralyze the enemy's perception of the battlefield and destroy their will to fight. Now, there's a lot of words in there. It's rapid dominance. It is a tactic to go in quickly and fiercely and powerfully. You don't just engage a little bit and retreat, engage over here. It is a massive show of force, rapid dominance to show overwhelming power, spectacular displays of force to paralyze the enemy's perception of the battlefield and destroy their will to fight. It shocks them with the awesomeness of the power of this battle technique. And we're going to see here tonight that when God chooses, God shows up in that very way. There's no shock and awe that any military has ever carried out like when God shows up. So let's begin there in the first part of this. In uh, all, many of the Psalms, you see a superscription that's the small little words above that. They're actually a part of the psalm. And it says, for the choir director, a psalm of David, the servant of the Lord, who spoke to the Lord the words of this song in the day that the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. And he said, that actually is really the first verse of that psalm. If you know your Bible, you probably have read that somewhere else in 2 Samuel 22. Those exact words are recorded, the exact words. So this is talking about some instances in David's life again when the enemy is coming against him. He is struggling with the force and the power of those who would thwart God's will and God's will for David's life. And he cries out to God 
and God shows up. It's like an autobiography. It's David saying, let me tell you what happened. Let me tell you what God did. Let me tell you what I thought about it. And this is what I'm going to do about it. And so we'll see all of those things show up in this psalm. Um, he's reminiscing. Now, a lot of times it's fun to reminisce. I know some things we don't want to remember. We try to forget. But it's fun to reminisce. My family over the holidays pulled out old pictures and we laughed, you know. Uh, my wife is an optician, so she t sells people glasses all the time. And our styles of glasses change so much. I pulled one out when I was in my 20s, and I think they were this big. I mean, literally, they covered my whole face almost. And, and my wife said, those are getting popular again. So if y'all see me with some great big ones, she did it to me the next time you see me. But we reminisce about good things of our life and we, we think about our children or our family growing up. David's doing that too. There was a time of Camelot. It was a time when Israel was doing well and God was miraculously working in, in David's life and the people's life. And so David often in his life thinks back about some of those times. I think back in my life, Billy Graham is uh, someone that I had great respect for. I knew that one day I was going to hear uh, that Billy Graham had passed away, but he'd been used in my life for decades. I've read many of his books. Uh, I've heard him speak on a couple occasions. And I was actually standing right where I am tonight on a Wednesday morning, just finished the men's Wednesday morning Bible study when a man at the back said, I just got word that Billy Graham has passed away. And I couldn't help repeat what Billy Graham said about that moment. He often said, someday you're going to hear on the radio or on the television or read in the newspaper that Billy Graham is dead. Don't believe it. At that moment, I'll be more alive than I've ever been before. And I take great confidence in that and comfort in the fact that he is with our Lord. But Billy Graham and his team in 1949, I briefly want to share this with you, was teaching and preaching a revival services that they called Crusades in Modesto, California. They were watching other ministries uh, that were springing up and God would use them for a while, but those ministries seemed to fail. They had problems and struggles. So Billy Graham sent the other three of his team back to the hotel rooms and he said, I want you to go back and pray. I want you to ask God, what are the things we need to be careful about so that this ministry will not be attacked and it will not be destroyed and we can be faithful. Now, this is 1949. They came back together and they came up with four things and they called it for six dec decades, the Modesto Manifesto. And this is what they agreed to do. They said, when we go into a city, we will not inflate the numbers. If 10,000 people show up, we're not gonna act like there's 20,000 people. They're gonna have integrity in that. We are not going to beg for money. This ministry is not going to be about money and how much we can accumulate. They got accused of that as others have before, but they have never done that. I've been with them personally and watched how they handle their business and they've never done that. Thirdly, they said, we're going to go into the cities and have these revival services and we're not going to talk bad negatively about the churches and the pastors in those communities. We're going to try to build them up, encourage them. And fourthly, they agreed in 1949 that each of them would never be alone in a room with another woman other than their wife, ever. Billy Graham even had president's wives say, I need to talk to you. And he'd say, I'd be glad to visit with you and talk to you in an open room in a restaurant where other people are around. No, I want to talk to you privately. And he wouldn't do it because he kept that word and a safeguard for that ministry. So I have great respect for the ministry of the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. That is part of my story. That's part of his story. And this psalm is David's story. Look with me in the first verse. We're gonna see the first section. David's gonna say, who is God? He says, I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord's my rock and my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Look at all those uh, names that he's given him. God is my rock, fortress, deliverer, refuge, shield, horn. Horn in Hebrew is Q-E-R-E-N, and it means power. If you've studied the book of Daniel, when those horns rise up, it's a symbol of power. Even on animals, uh, when animals have horns, it is a symbol of their power. 
And David's saying, that's who my God is. He's my rock. He's my fortress. He's deliverer. I call upon the Lord, verse 3, who's worthy to be praised, and I'm saved from my enemies. David is making it clear that God is the one who's all-powerful. He is almighty. <coughs> we don't address someone uh, here on this earth as almighty because we are not all-powerful. We are not omnipotent. And yet, David's not going to say, God, you are the best, you're the strongest, you're the greatest, but you're distant. I wish I could know you. I wish I could hear something from you. He doesn't say that. God is not only all-powerful, but he's personal. And he said, I called upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and I'm saved from my enemies. God is so great, so powerful, and yet he is so tender. You want a good study in your Bible? Uh, I may teach on this some in another setting, but study about the power and the strength and the gentleness of Christ. Now that sounds kind of like an oxymoron, doesn't it? But it's not. Study about the power and the strength and the gentleness of Christ. All throughout the scripture, great verses that talk about those that know the gentleness of God, which is quiet strength. David is saying, God, you are great. You are great. The second thing that David starts going to talk about in verse 4 is he's going to tell us his plight. He's going to tell us his woes again. i got to tell you what's happened to me. And here he begins. The cords of death, that's like the ropes of death, encompass me. The torrents of ungodliness terrified me. Torrents are storms the storm clouds and the rain and the floods. The cords of Sheol surround me. That's the grave. The snares of death confronted me. Something has happened in this circumstance with David again. We don't know if it's Saul who was throwing javelins at David, who was so jealous of him that he tried to kill him. And that's a good thing for you and I to be careful. Did you know the Bible tells us in the book of James that out of jealousy or envy, every evil work can come? In other words, someone that is eaten up with jealousy could end up doing anything. Years ago, I heard the story on the news about a mother whose daughter tried out for the cheerleading squad and she didn't make it. So she just had one of those other girls killed. You remember that? So how could that happen? Because the Bible says jealousy can lead to any other kind of wicked sin. So something's happened here, whether it's, it's Saul or whether it's somebody else that is trying to kill David. The snares of death confronted me. This is kind of the language that Jonah had in the book of Jonah, where Jonah says, I'm in the belly of this fish and I got seaweed all around my head and I'm going to die. That's what he felt like. In my distress, I called upon the Lord. It's interesting that word distress in Hebrew is T-Z-A-R. And it, it, it describes it, it's like in a closed place. Now, I don't want to give any of you people that might suffer from this any kind of remembrance, but does anybody have trouble with claustrophobia? It's not a little thing. If you struggle with that, that's a big, big thing. Lock somebody up in a little, little area that has that and you'll find out. And that's what David's saying here. In my distress... It was like I was closed into this very tight space and I didn't know what was going to happen. And he says, I cried to God for my help and he heard my voice out of his temple. Now, there's a connotation there that David prays, but God is far away. He's in his temple. So how in the world could God hear David when he's in his temple and he doesn't seem to be close to him? Uh, if you remember your history, before we had uh, cell phones, there, were, uh, there was a man named Alexander Graham, what? Bell. And in, on March the 10th, 1876, he had invented what we know as the telephone, and he made the very first telephone call to his assistant, Thomas Watson. And you remember what he said? Mr. Watson, come here. I want to see you. I thought about that and I thought, what, what would you have said or what would I have said? I would have probably said, can you hear me now? <laughs> the very first phone call into the next room, and that was an amazing technological feat that now we can talk to people across the world. 
Well, here David says, I cried out to God and he heard my voice when he was in his temple. And we need to realize, and I know you do, that God can hear your prayer wherever you're at, whatever you're going through, no matter how loud the world is, how frightened you are or how the circumstances crowd around you, God can hear you and he wants to hear your prayer. And that's what David is saying. And my cry for help before him came into his ears. I'll bet I could start right here and go down the aisles and listen to your stories and you could tell me something just like David. Let me tell you what I went through in my life. It might be the death of a loved one. It might be uh, financial struggles. It might be problems with family members. It could be addictions or temptations, whatever it may, maybe physical things that you're facing health-wise. I'll bet we all have circumstances that we could say, let me tell you what I've gone through in my life. Well, David is saying, man, I remember how distressful it was. It was a frightening, frightening time. But I cried out to God and he heard me and he's answered my prayers. You remember it was David that wrote Psalm 23, yea, though I walk through what? The valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. David's heart is overflowing, even in the midst of where he could die. Guys, uh, what Jared shared with you a moment ago is a very, very real prayer request. That little girl, 13 years old, is... Uh, highly autistic, she's unresponsive, uh, communicating uh, verbally, and uh, many of them want to run. If they can get loose, they want to run, and that's what she and her, her sister did, and they ran out into the streets, and a man in a dually pickup at 60 miles an hour hit her and just ran over her. Put yourself in that mom's position to get that phone call, that dad's position. Can you imagine what your heart would feel like? You may say, well, Mike, I can because I've gone through some of those things. Well, that's what David's talking about here. These are not just little inconveniences. He is in distress. He's in trouble, as many of these Psalms show. But the third part of this that shows up in this Psalm is when God looks down at his son David... And he knows that people are troubling him, hurting him, even wanting to kill him. And God says, not on my watch. I've had some friends that were willing to stand with me through some tough times. And I admire them and I thank them to this day. I've got an older brother who's a lot littler than me, but he's fearless. And if he listens to this, I honor my older brother named Rocky because times in my life when I needed a big brother, Rocky showed up. Well, David's in trouble. He's hurting and God is gonna show up. You may be here tonight and you may say, well, I haven't ever been to church before. I don't come very often or whatever. But I wanna tell you that these were, we're not here to point fingers at anybody. Yes, we stand for the truth. And the leadership of your church ought to be the first ones pointing the finger at ourselves. I need to let the Lord change me and I need to be more like his word. But we're here because God's Bible has the answers. You can go any other book, any other philosophy, any other religion, and all the people that are listening to those things, they're trying to hope someday they can be good enough by what they do to get to a, some kind of supreme being. They don't have any confidence of salvation. And I, uh, when you're with them when they die, they don't have that peace to know. I've been privileged for 40 years to be pe with people when they took their last breath. And I tell you what, it is an amazing miracle to watch what God does in those last few moments. Because God gives his children supernatural peace and strength. So have you ever pictured the time when you needed to stand up for somebody else. Those of you who are parents, is there anything you wouldn't do for your children? Not long ago, I purchased something for my daughter and I'm gonna mail it to her in the mail here in a few days. And I'm gonna ask if Nate would put that up there. And you dads, uh, would you see if you could relate to this? This is the t-shirt, sweatshirt that I bought for my daughter. Can I read it to you? It says, yes, I'm a stubborn daughter, and she is. 
but not yours. I'm the property of a freaking awesome dad. He's a bit crazy and scares me sometimes. Mess with me and the beast in him will awake and they'll never find your body. Yes, he bought me this shirt. Now, if you're a dad, you can relate to that. I'll guarantee you. Somebody mess with your daughter and there's nothing you wouldn't do. Any mama bears here tonight? Any mama bears? We've got some hands going up. Mess with their cubs. I want to watch <laughs> because there's nothing we wouldn't do. Well, that's what's going to happen here in this psalm. God's had enough of people messing with David. And there's going to be shock and awe. Can I read it to you? Look at verse 7. Then the earth shook and quaked. When God shows up, he can just cause an earthquake to happen. The foundations of the mountain were trembling. They were shaking because he was angry. You don't want to get God angry. How many of you remember the, the, the Hulk? Back in the 70s or 80s, you remember he was this doctor and he drank this thing and he, he turns into this green, you know, the Incredible Hulk. But you remember what he says when somebody's mistreating him? Don't make me angry. You won't like me <laughs> when I'm angry. And God has watched his servant David mistreated long enough. So God shows up, the earth shakes and quakes, the foundations of the mountain are trembling. Smoke went out of his nostrils, that's in his wrath. Fire from his mouth devoured. Coals were kindled by it. Did you know that the Bible says when Jesus comes back, when the Antichrist is here on the earth, the Antichrist is going to be destroyed by something. It's not going to be an anti-ballistic missile. It's not going to be with the Moab, mother of all bombs. The Bible says the Antichrist is going to be destroyed with the word of Jesus' mouth and the brightness of his coming. Just by Jesus showing up, the enemy is going to be destroyed. Isn't that cool? And that's what here is a preview of that. David has been mistreated long enough and God says it's not going to happen anymore. Smoke went out of his nostrils, fire from his mouth, devoured coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down. I preached a sermon not long ago here and the title of it was Don't Make Me Come Down There. But he is. He's coming down now on behalf of David with thick darkness under his feet. And that means he's going to sneak up on them. They're not going to see him coming. He'll be there before they know it. He rode upon a cherub and flew and he sped. And if you got your driver's license and your parents give you a hard time about speeding, take him to this verse right here. God speeds. You can use the Bible. God, and he sped upon the wings of the wind. Now, what have I just described? Smoke coming out of his nostrils, fire coming out of his mouth. What is it? He could fly. What is a picture? A lot of movies been made with dragons. And it's a symbol of God's power when he shows up. God's mightier than all. Uh, when I would play hooky and stay home from school when I was in, in kindergarten, uh, I, I didn't go to kindergarten, um, I don't know why they wouldn't let me go to kindergarten. There may be a reason for that, but I'm, I didn't. But uh, three o'clock in the afternoon, you know, the movies would come on and always it was Godzilla. Oh, and that boy scared me. He was big. And then later on, they had Godzilla facing King Kong. And you just wondered who was going to win that battle because these are two monsters. Well, guys... What the Bible's talking about here is there's no other thing that could compare when God shows up. He's the mightiest. He's the fiercest. He bowed the heavens and came down. And one day the Bible says the sky itself is going to roll back like a scroll when the Father and Jesus show up. That's how big they are. Verse 11, he made darkness his hiding place, his canopy around him, darkness of waters, thick clouds of the skies. This time... It's not God showing up in the midst of the storm. This time, the storm is God. And he's coming in might and power. There's a verse in Psalm 2, if you want to turn there, verse 12. I want to read it to you. It says, do homage to the sun. Another version you might have says, kiss the sun, S-O-N. That he not become angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath may soon be kindled. 
And it warns us to make sure that we do not act in a way that could anger God. I'm afraid for our country. I'm afraid for our country because we're making choices right now as a whole society and we're letting some of those things take place that I know God's not pleased with. And if God chose to get angry, we've never seen anything in our lifetimes. All he would have to do is move his hands of protection back off of our land. He's had his hand on this country because we've been a brother to Israel. I'll bless them that bless you. But as Tommy said this morning, in that same thing, he said, but I'll curse them that curse you. So you pray for the peace of Jerusalem. You pray that America stands with Israel. From the brightness before him, verse 12, he passed his thick clouds, hailstones, coals of fire. The Lord also thundered in the heavens and the Most High uttered his voice. When God speaks in the Old Testament, the Israelites said, Moses, we can't stand the might and the power, the awesomeness of God. Would you go up and talk to him and you come and talk to us? That's how powerful the voice of God was. Hailstones and coals of fire. In Revelation, there's going to be a day that a hundred pound hailstones fall on this earth when God executes his wrath. Verse 14. He sent out his arrows, scattered them, lightning flashes in abundance and routed them. Then the channels of water appeared. I think that refers to the Red Sea. The Red Sea was one of the most awesome displays of might and power that the world's ever known. God had said to his people, come out of Egypt. Pharaoh, let my people go. And as they're escaping Egypt, the mighty uh, Egyptian army is coming after them and all their horses and chariots and their, their military and the children of Israel can't turn back because of the army and they can't go ahead because of the Red Sea. Don't let anybody teach you it was the Sea of Reeds. You know, there's always somebody gonna try to say, that's not the way it happens. That's not what God's word says. Hold on to what God said. I believe it very strong. God sent a mighty east wind. He separated the Red Sea and the children of Israel walked safely on dry ground through the midst of the Red Sea and the sea was like a wall on both sides of them. Wouldn't you like to have been there that day? Pretty awesome, powerful. And that's what I want to share with you. That's what God does when he shows up in his people's lives. If I as a dad would say, mess with my daughter and I'm going to do whatever I can and that I'm humanly capable of doing, how much more would God say that about you and me? Because we're his children. Don't mess with my children. It says here, then the channels of water appeared. The foundation of the world were laid bare. At your rebuke, O Lord, at the blast of the breath of your nostrils. He sent from on high. He took me. You know what this is? This is one of the greatest, other than Jesus Christ himself, search and rescue missions there ever has been. God came down from heaven to extract David out of his circumstance, to rescue him. The force and the might of an omnipotent God says, not on my watch, I'm coming to rescue you. And he pulled him out of the trouble that he was in. He sent from on high, he took me, he drew me out of many waters. Those who work right now with uh, the United States Navy or the Coast Guard, what an awesome job that is. But oftentimes they're called upon to go out in storms and to jump out of helicopters or rappel down in icy water of the Atlantic and to rescue people that are about to drown. And man, I admire those people. If you go to uh, the Atlantic Ocean, there is a, uh, there's a place that's called the Graveyard of the Atlantic where a lot of ships throughout history have have crashed and people have died there. And the people that work in those stations, in rescue stations, one of them has, or maybe more than one, has a banner above the door before they go out. And it says, you must go out, but you may not come back. They're willing to go out and risk their life to extract somebody out of certain death. And that's what God's doing here. Later on in the New Testament, it says, Jesus came to seek and to save them that were lost. That was me. 
He came in a search and rescue mission. And I believe if you were the only one that had ever lived, he would have done that just for you. That's how much he loves us. So this is an extraction for David. He sent from on high. He took me, he drew me out of many waters. He delivered me from my strong enemy, from those who hated me, for they were too mighty for me. David doesn't throw his shoulders back and say, I'm gonna whip this guy and you just watch what I'm gonna do. Maybe you've watched some football lately. And I'm always, I'm just always amazed. Somebody may be getting beat 40 to nothing and they make a tackle and they start jumping around like they're the greatest in the world. I've made a tackle and I, I want to say you're getting beat 40 to nothing. You have nothing to brag about. But that's what we do as human beings, don't we? He goes on and he describes that and I won't take, uh, look at verse 19. He brought me forth also in a broad place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. David's saying, look what God did. If God be for us, who can be against us? And that's what David is saying. Uh, I had a surgery one time and I was in one of the local hospitals. And you know, after surgery, you go through what's called uh, recovery. And that's when you're kind of in and out of the anesthetic wearing off and pain kind of shows up a little bit. And the first words that I remember in a recovery room was one of the nurses saying, uh, you're hurting, not in my recovery room. And he put something in that little port that was an IV in my arm. And in about five seconds, I went, ah. I asked him for a five-gallon bucket of whatever that was that I could take home with me. Because in five seconds, it took away that pain. And we're living at a time which is miraculous that you and I have medical uh, technology that we have to help us during that time. But I still remember that nurse saying, not in my recovery room, you're not. You're not going to hurt in mine because he had power to do something about it. And that's what God's saying. David, you're not going to have to go through this alone. I'm coming. I'm coming to get you. You know what this is a picture of? One day, all of our labor is going to be over. And God's going to turn to Jesus and say, go get the church. Go get my people. And Jesus is going to come to reap this earth in that great rapture. And in a moment's time, we'll go to be with him. Are you ready? Amen. David, go, it goes, I want to tell you something. That was shock and awe. When God showed up, it was fast. It was powerful. It was overwhelming. It uh, took the enemy by surprise. And they had no power whatsoever to fight against David because God was there. The Lord has rewarded me, verse 20, according to my righteousness. Verse 21, I've kept the ways of the Lord have not wickedly departed from my God. Notice David is saying, I'm not going to live for God. I'm not going to follow his word. I'm not going to be what God wants me to be, but I still want him to come rescue me. Is that possible in our world today that people want the blessings, but they don't want the, the obedience? The promises are to those that obey, that love the Lord, follow him and trust him. If you're a parent here tonight, isn't it such a blessing to bless your children when they've done something well? Man, it's so good to give them something, to praise them, to let them know you're so happy with them. How much more God with us. Some people say, well, I've tried Jesus before. Like they went to the store and tried him on and he didn't fit. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about Humans saying, I need him. I cannot live without him. And I certainly can't live forever without him. So I humble myself. I repent of my sins. I confess before God. I yield to him. I ask him to forgive me and to change me, to come be the Lord and Savior of my life. You've heard those words before. But stop with me for just a minute before I go any further. I have to do this a lot in my life. Psalm 46.10 says, be still and know that I'm God. Stop for a minute. I've heard those words about I need to confess and repent and ask Jesus in my heart and trust him and believe that he died on the cross for me, that God raised him from the dead, and I need to become a Christian. I need to follow him. If you were that little girl before that truck at 60 miles an hour hit her, would you want to pray that prayer then? If you were the mom and dad of that little girl would you want to make sure the answer to that prayer? 
I want to encourage you and you encourage me. Before tragedy hits your life, before the storm comes, why not tonight? Why not tonight come and say, oh Lord, you've been working on my heart for a long time. I know people have been praying for me. I haven't lived the way I should. Guys, guess what? None of us have. We all need this Savior that we're thinking about and talking about. Why not tonight? David goes and he says, I tell you what, God is good. God is good. Verse 22, his ordinances were before me. Verse 23, I was blameless with him. I kept myself from iniquity. Therefore, the Lord has recompensed me. He lived a consistent faithful life. Here's something interesting, verse 25. With the kind, God says, you show yourself kind. God will be kind to people that are kind. And with the blameless, you show yourself blameless. Those that have integrity, God's going to meet them right where they are. With the pure, you show yourself pure. Those are clean and wholesome people. God said, I can deal with them. But he said, with the crooked, And that's the ones that are walking in a way not pleasing to God. God will show himself astute. You know what that means? That word actually means twisted. It means like you took two sticks and you twisted them together. Have you ever heard of a circumstance getting all twisted up? This is God saying, if somebody wants to be astute, if they want to be rebellious and reject me, I can meet them right there also. For you have... Save an afflicted people. When we were little children, if you were in Sunday school, they taught us, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And it goes on to say, we are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. And David's saying, we're weak, but you loved us so much that you saved us. The next portion of the psalm is that David's gonna say, you know who gave me power to live right I didn't do it because I was a good guy. I went to seminary. I went to church all the time. He said, God enabled me. You remember these words? They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Those are the ones that wait on God. They obey God. And it says God will give them power because they're walking with him. They're trusting him. David says in verse 28, for you light my lamp. I love that. The Lord, my God, illumines my darkness. For by you, I can run upon a troop. And the next verse is there. He goes on and he says, I can leap over a wall. He, God is a shield. He's a rock. He girds me with strength. He makes my way blameless. Verse 34, he trains my hands for battle. He gives skill. He's the shield of my salvation. Your right hand upholds me. And here's that verse I mentioned earlier. And your gentleness makes me great. This isn't self-exaltation or pride. I'm the king over Israel and what I say goes and you better listen to me or this is David saying, oh God, I'm an afflicted person but I cried out to you and you heard me and you came and saved me and you came and enabled me. Look at verse 36. You enlarged my steps and my feet have not slipped. You gave me stability in my life. Do you know what some people would give right now for just some peace? Mentally, physically, in their home. Some people that are in our prisons right now, we have a jail ministry where men and women have gone faithfully for years. And you know what some of those people would give? They'd give everything they had or they had had in their life for just a little bit of peace. And that's what David's saying. You've given me peace. And I did not turn back until they were consumed. I overtook my enemies. He had courage. Courage is not some prideful thing. John Wayne used to say something I thought was pretty cool. Courage is being afraid, but saddling up anyway. You have girded me with strength, verse 39. Verse 40, the enemies turned their backs. I destroyed them. They cried for help. There was none to save. He did not answer them. I beat them, verse 42, fine as the dust. Remember this statement. God gives grace for the place and mercy for the moment. You may feel like, I'm not sure I could go through what these people are going through. And right now in our church, we have, we have some godly women that have taught ladies for decades. They are suffering. Becky, would you agree in our, in our church? I'm thinking of a couple ladies that almost like a modern day Job 
They're going through health issues. They're going through struggles. They've, they've had loss of loved ones in their family. And you know what they're doing? They're grieving. They're hurt, hurting. But they're walking faithfully. I sent an email to one of them and I said, you are a bright spot in this church. You are a bright spot in my life. You are such an encouragement that all you're going through, you're walking faithfully with Christ. Thank you for doing that. God gives grace for the place and mercy for the moment. And the last part of this psalm is, David's gonna say, and because of what God's done for me, he came with shock and awe. He came and he defended me and he rescued me. I'm gonna tell the world. We used to sing a song a long time ago. I'll tell the world that I'm a Christian. Did anybody ever sing that one? I'm not ashamed, his name to bear. I'll tell the world that I'm a Christian and I'll go with him anywhere. That's what David is saying. Verse 43, you've delivered me from the contentions of my people, of the people. You've placed me as head of the nations. Does it sound familiar? David was raised up. Joseph, Joseph, it didn't look like he was going to see the things of God uh, promised to him going to take place, but they did. He became second in command in, in Egypt. A people whom I have not known serve me. As soon as they hear, they obey me. Foreigners submit to me. Foreigners fade away, come trembling out of their fortresses. David is saying, what a difference God has made. Look what God did. And I'll bet you every one of us here that know Jesus tonight could say, let me tell you what God's done in my life. Look what God did. Real quickly, 12 years ago, I showed up on this campus and I sat in the Summerall Center, listened to Tommy Nelson. I'd preached for 28 years at a, a church, a Bible church, and I'd been in ministry for about 30 years. But I moved here, and I remember like it's right now. Listen to Tommy, and I love Tommy. And I remember thinking, would there ever be a time at Denton Bible Church that I could share his word? I didn't know. And I look at you here tonight and I count it such a privilege to be here. In a few short number of years, I can say with David, look what God's done to give an opportunity like this tonight. I want you to notice verse 49. It says, I'm gonna give thanks to you among the nations, O Lord. I'm gonna tell everybody what you've done and I'm gonna sing praises in your name. In a few minutes, I'm going to close in a word of prayer and Mark and the worship team is going to come back up. And they lead us well and you sang well a while ago and this is not to say you don't because you sing great. But I want to ask us tonight when we sing our closing song for you to sing it louder and with thankfulness in your heart and just a little bit more of your heart poured into it than you have before. Because that's what David's gonna say. I'm gonna tell the world and I'm gonna sing about how God is good. Would you do that when we leave here in a few moments for our closing song when Mark leads us? Pour your heart into it. And don't sing it for me. We sing it together, but let's sing it to God tonight and tell him, God, you're good. And I wanna tell the world about it. The last of this, he says, I'll sing praises to your name. He gives great deliverance to his king, shows loving kindness to his anointed, to David and his descendants forever. You know, I mentioned to you a while ago that it's great when a big brother shows up and takes up for you. It's great when dad or mom show up and they take up for you. It's great when you stand up for your friend. I thought about a lot of the songs that I remember in my life that were about friends. I'm gonna remember a few of, a few of them. Uh, say amen if you remember some of these. Bridge over troubled water. Remember that? You got friends that'll come. Uh, a song, I'll be there. You remember that one? I'm gonna get by with a little help from my friends. You're my best friend. Thank you for being a friend. How about this one? You got a friend in me. You know, y'all been watching those cartoons, haven't you? I have too. Uh, when you're down and troubled and you need a helping hand. What's that one? You've got a friend. There's a bunch of them. When the night has come and the land is dark and the moon is only light, we'll see. Now I won't be afraid. Oh, I won't be afraid. Just as long as you stand, stand by me. 
You are the wind beneath my wings. What about this? When I'm down and oh, my soul so weary. When troubles come and my heart burden be, then I'm still and wait here in the silence until you come and sit a while with me. You raise me up so I can walk on mountains. There's a lot of songs, and there's been a lot of them. Uh, Lean on me. Boy, we used to go around and sing that one all the time. When you are not strong, and I'll be your friend, and I'll help you carry on. And I tell you what, I got a lot of friends. You're here, part of that group here tonight that I can count on that same way. But as great as all those songs are, there is no friend like Jesus. There's an old hymn of the faith that this is entitled to God be the glory. Great things he has done. And that's what we're here to do tonight. Just like David of old, I want to tell you what God's done. He's a good God. He's a powerful God. He shows up with might and strength and he saved me. He heard my prayer. He took care of those enemies and I'm going to tell the world what he's done for me. I've got a good, good God. So when you think about Psalm 18 and you think about your life where you're at right now, you are just as important to God as David was. There's nothing you're going through that God doesn't already know what you're going through or you will go through. You may say, my my life's pretty cool right now. Everything's going pretty good. Praise God for that. Enjoy that time, but get ready. It doesn't always last. God's gonna bring you through something else because as long as we're here on this earth, we're gonna go through struggles to make us stronger. And you know what happens when I see you go through struggles and you walk faithfully to Christ, with Christ, that builds me up. That gives me strength and confidence and encouragement. But I want you to know that if you're in that cave, David might have been in the cave hiding from Saul at this time, we don't know. If you're in that pit, financially, physically, mentally, emotionally, we've got an epidemic in our country right now of anxiety and depression and, and panic attacks and And I want to tell you, God can deliver you from that. Isaiah 26, 3, that will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusts in thee. That's not an automatic thing. I'm going to memorize that verse and repeat it and I'll never have another bad thought. No, God just says, I'll help you. I'll be with you. I'll train you. I'll show you and I can deliver you from the thoughts that are discouraging and help you to think well about the good things God's doing. But just remember, wherever you are, whatever you've done, you may find yourself and it looks like the enemy's getting closer. That's what David was in Psalm 18. But he said, I cried out. And although God was in the temple, he heard me and he came and delivered me. I want to close with an illustration I've used a lot of times and it's out of a really theological movie called The Lion King. Got some good music in that movie. I like some of the songs, you know. Some of them aren't too good, but some of them are all right. I like the first one better. I don't know if y'all saw the second one. I like the first one better. Uh, I just uh, thought it was well done. But one of my favorite scenes is with Simba, who is at the mouth of the cave, and the hyenas are coming. You remember the hyenas are the bad guys. They want to kill Simba and keep him from being... What, what he is rightfully supposed to be. Now, Simba's supposed to be the king, but he's a little lion. He's not the king yet. He has to grow up. And Mufasa, his dad, is trying to teach him how to be the king, but he's a little lion right now, and he's not ready for that. And the hyenas are getting closer and closer. And if you remember that scene, they're inching forward, and they're laughing like they do, just like the enemy would want to do to us tonight, mocking and making fun. And they want to destroy him who would be king. And Simba doesn't know what to do. He's a lion, but he's just a little lion, so he doesn't know how to fight yet, and he doesn't have all the power that he would one day possess. And as the hyenas got closer and closer and closer, I picture David that same way, the enemy coming closer to him, and the things that we go through in our lives that same way, getting closer and louder. Do you remember what happened? Simba just had to be true to how God made him. He was a lion, and he said, well, I've got to roar because that's what lions do. 
And right when the, the hyenas were about to attack him, Simba opens his mouth and this little bitty lion is going to roar. And we hear a huge, mighty, powerful roar. Because who is in the cave with him? Mufasa. His daddy was there. And the hyenas run off and they're afraid. Well, guess who's in the cave with us? God is. Guess who was the fourth man in the fire for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? It was Jesus. Guess who was in the lion's den with Daniel? It was God. And he's there for us too. Psalm 18. Shock and awe. And David said, I want to tell you who God is. I want to tell you how good he is. I want to tell you what he's done for me. And by the way, I'm going to sing. And I'm going to sing about how great he is. Mark, would you and the rest of the crew come up? And would you tonight join with me in singing this last song? Whatever it is. These guys have prayerfully picked it out. It'll be great. But would you just sing it like you're singing it right in front of God in the throne room of heaven? Because God loves. In fact, the Bible says God inhabits the praises of his people. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that there's no pit so deep that you're not deeper. There's no fire or earthquake or storm that we could be in that you can't deliver us from. You can hear our prayer no matter how loud the enemy is or whatever's going on in our life, and you can deliver us and forgive us of our sins and change our lives. And if people are here tonight and they don't know you, they're not saved. Oh, Lord, would you? By your Holy Spirit, would you convict them of their sins just like you've done all the rest of us? Let them know how badly they need you and let them know they need to do it now before it's too late. Men and women, heaven and hell are real, both of them. And the decisions you've made already will determine your eternal destiny. Make sure tonight before you leave because God so loved the world that he came to rescue you and me. Father, thank you that you're the God of David. Thank you that you're the God of our lives also. And now, would you let us sing from our hearts this last song to tell the world how good you are. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.